sort of invented California rock. So how did it happen? Did you sit down and say, come on guys, let's invent California rock? <laughs> no, what we did say was, let's make a song about surfing. And then we went on to sing about other things that, like California girls and, and um, sing about uh, our cars and our school. We sang a lot about the things that, that were in our immediate environment in Southern California. And close to us was the beach. And to get there, we drove our car uh, to either go take our girlfriend or go see our girlfriend, <laughs> go surfing. And all these things just kind of uh, became known as the West Coast Sound and, as you say, California rock. And, and uh, it was just the way we sounded. And since we were singing about uh, the subject matter, that that's what it became, you know, known as. So, it, we, I don't, I don't ever think it was. It was more of a West Coast sound, and there were East East Coast groups in the United States back at that time. They had a more in, inner city kind of sound, which was influenced by the uh, R and B or the doo wop groups of the '50s and early '60s. So that, that influenced more the East Coast sound. And then ours was more uh, based on the rock and roll of uh, Chuck Berry, but synthesized with the way we sounded, which was how we still sound. <laughs> Go ahead. So that's, that's about it. it, wasn't, it well, I, don't think it, I think it was just a label attached to uh, our group and a couple others. Um, uh, by the record industry is just something easy to say California sound or West Coast sound. To me, I didn't really pay much attention to that. <laughs> the very first, 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 first rehearsals uh, were, I think, when we were, we were trying to uh, learn how to perform, <laughs> meaning we, our first song that we ever recorded was called Surfin'. And uh, that was in the fall of 1961. And at that time, Carl Wilson was the only person who could play a guitar. He's our lead guitarist. And he played guitar. Brian played the piano. But on the record, he played just a snare drum. One little drum, snare drum. Just hit that. And uh, now, Al Jardine, who played guitar as well, he played a stand-up bass, what they call stand-up bass, the big actual bass instrument that you see in orchestras, you know. And so there's bass, guitar, drum, singular, <laughs> one. <laughs> and then we just sang, sang the song uh, with that as the backing. And so when we uh, began to ask to be asked to perform, in Southern California at fraternity parties or graduation nights and parties and, and so on, and the high school assemblies, um, they um, the necessitated our getting together and learning how to actually perform instruments. So I, I played the saxophone a little bit. Uh, and um, so Al then played rhythm guitar, Carl Lee played lead guitar, Bert Brian took up and learned the bass, and Dennis learned the drums. Before that, they'd never played bass and drums, so um, that was it. So the first uh, rehearsals were kind of funny. It was kind of everybody getting used to playing together. And uh, we played a lot of very, very small places. Played a lot of little, little parties for 100 people or 150 people. Fraternity parties, like I said, we would drive to and, and perform at a UCLA. As a matter of fact, we played a fraternity party. We played another one at University of Arizona, um, and in different places like that. Just small parties. That's how we first began to perform. Our first performance as the Beach Boys was New Year's Eve, 196 December 31st, 1961. And we played three songs, and Surfin' was one of them. That was a hit by then. And uh, we played uh, 
another couple of early rock and roll songs. We didn't have our own songs. We just had one of our own, and then we sang other songs covers. of that time. Yeah, covers, exactly. So uh, I thought that was pretty good. We got paid $300 for doing three songs. I said, this is pretty good, $60 <laughs> each for three songs. That's neat. So um, we were hooked, you know, <laughs> that, that did it. We, were, we thought that was a pretty good deal. And it was exciting to be out on stage with, with people and, and have a hit record. That was our first hit record. It, was, it went to number two in Los Angeles, but it went to number one in Detroit and one in Las Vegas, different places around the country. It was not released completely nationally because when it, was very, it was on a very small recording label called Candix. But our next record came out on Capitol, which is EMI in the rest of the world. Capi EMI owns Capitol Records in the United States. And, and uh, that's where Surf and Safari was released. And that became a, a, a big national hit. And then the next hit was Surf in USA. And that was a worldwide uh, hit. It was, number, it was very popular in this part of the world, Scandinavia. And, as well as South Africa and Philippines and Hong Kong and, and of course it's number one in the U.S. and I don't know how it did in England but but uh, it, we did well enough in England by 1966 to be voted the number one group in England. Number two was the Beatles, number three was the Rolling Stones. How did that feel? Real good. Was it a surprise <laughs> for Beatles and for you? It, it was a big surprise I'm sure for the Liverpool lads. But I, uh, that made us feel good. Of course, not, no, no group was more uh, extraordinarily successful than the Beatles at that time. So to have that kind of recognition for the Beach Boys uh, uh, felt really good. Carl Wilson is the lead guitarist. He's the brother of Dennis Wilson and Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson, who is a member of the Beach Boys but does not tour, he's more of a recluse. He's, He's emotionally fragile. Um, in fact, he's been classified or categorized uh, by uh, psychiatrists as paranoid schizophrenic, meaning he's paranoid or fearful of a lot of things. That's how his mind works. And schizophrenic, meaning he, imag he imagines things. So uh, he's not comfortable being out in society too much. He doesn't like touring so much. He likes his home environment in the studio. That's where he feels secure. And so he, he, he uh, had a nervous breakdown in 1965. He was touring and trying to produce music. And it was just too much for him. So he quit the touring group, focused on doing the music. And as a result of that, he came out with the Pet Sounds album. He's the one who did the orchestrations. He's the one that did the musical part. I complimented him with concepts and lyrics and a lot of the most successful or most of the Beach Boys most successful songs now um, so he, uh, he to this day still has his abilities but he hasn't had anybody with him writing with him to to bring out the kind of successful creativity that we did together in the 60s uh, we hope we'll get together with him in in the future and do, do that. Uh, Carl Wilson, his brother, he and I have been very successful together, even though we haven't written songs together. His voice on Good Vibrations, singing the, the verses, and I singing the choruses with the, I'm picking up good vibrations. And it came along years later and did uh, Kokomo, where he, where, uh, he sings it, ooh, I want to take it down to Kokomo, the kind of higher part. And I'm going, uh, Aruba, Jamaica, <laughs> that kind of part. So the t me doing the lower, he doing the higher, and uh, it's a nice complementarity, I think. And, and it's been, that's been so on the two most successful records of our career. Number, number one most successful is Kokomo. Number two is Good Vibrations. And they're both number one records. 22 years apart, 66 for Good Vibrations, 88 for Kokomo. But Carl is, I think, of all of the people in the group, the most proficient musician 
in the sense of it, playing of the chords of the guitar. It, he's very, um, always very dependable, always extremely good musician, very concerned with the band and all the band members and how they're performing. He's very critical and maintains a high degree of performance quality in the band itself for the musicians. Uh, I am not as much of a musician. I'm more of a singer, and, and I like performing. But, um, but he is capable, because of his abilities, to, to, to be the, the leader of the band, though, so far as the musicianship is concerned. I'm more concerned with how the show flows, how it starts, and how it, how it, how it impacts upon the audience to give times that, during the show where there's energy and then there's times when it's more subtle. And the dynamics of it is what my, I'm concerned with. Just like I'm concerned mostly with the lyrics and the concepts and the music. Just like in Summer in Paradise, our new song, I wrote the words having to do with our concern about the environment, the ozone and pollution and toxic waste and all these things. And we want to bring back Summer in Paradise, which to me means bring back a state uh, of being where m mankind can enjoy what's provided by nature without destroying nature, and then therefore nature destroying us. Uh, so anyway, I'm concerned about that, and so that, that's my lyrical and conceptual input. So that's what I'm most concerned about. Al Jardine is is and was in the early days. A, like myself, a big fan of both um, folk music of the U.S., like Kingston Trio and a group called the Weavers. I mean, they're very much the folk music that was. It came from the Appalachian Mountains. It came from originally from Ireland and England, places like that, where they had a particular type of music that ultimately became what. The Everly Brothers sang. They call it rockabilly. And uh, we like the Everly Brothers and the Kingston Trio. And Al learned the guitar because of that influence of the Kingston Trio. But also, he liked the doo wop groups, the rock and roll, the R&B groups of the early, uh, the, the 50s and the early 60s. And so those two influences. He, he, Alan is the one who uh, suggested that we do Sloop John B. on the Pet Sounds album. Sloop John B. was originally recorded by the Kingston Trio, which is a very successful folk group in the U.S. about, about 1957, 8, and 9 in there. At any rate, uh, his influences, he's, he's, he has a real strong, clear voice. He is sang lead on Help Me Rhonda, for instance, and also Cotton Fields, which was very big in Europe. Um, uh, he, so he's, he's a, very, got a definite strong voice. Carl has a sweet, high voice. Alan has a stronger, uh, tends towards a higher tenor lead. And, uh, uh, of course, Bruce Johnston is an extremely uh, successful songwriter by virtue of having written one song that was a uh, huge hit, and that's called I Write the Song. It was made famous by Barry Manilow, who was originally recorded by Captain and Tennille, who are very good friends with Bruce. He met them. The captain of Captain and Tennille, was, his name is Daryl Dragon, and he used to play synthesizers and organ and keyboards with our group. And, and we were looking for a piano player at one time, and we auditioned piano players, and, and Tennille, Tony Tennille, came along and re rehearsed, and she, she actually played piano with us for a couple of years. So the captain and Tennille actually met through the Beach Boys, because we, we named Daryl Captain Keyboard. So uh, um, that was an interesting little uh, anecdote was, uh, well, the, the Beach Boys played uh, Cupid, I guess, on that one. It was fascinating in India, uh, but uh, that began, that, that story began in 1967, in December. The Beach Boys were invited to go to Paris 
to do a United Nations Children's Emergency Fund, UNICEF, show that was to be broadcast and was broadcast to all the countries of Europe. It was, I think it was simulcast. It was around Christmas time and all the, the, the national television stations of Europe, uh, I think, subscribed to the show, which produced money for UNICEF. And there was a benefit performance of this concert in Paris at this beautiful theater. And the night of the show, I remember, it was completely uh, an arist aristocratic audience. I mean, there, were, there was royalty from all around the, the world there, and, and lots of embassy people. It was quite an international audience. I mean, the, the, the Russian Red Army Choir was there, and the Turkish Ballet was there. And they had never performed on television before. They were dancing all over the place, and they had to rehearse according to the outlines that defined by the stage. It was quite interesting to watch all that during rehearsals. Marlon Brando and his Tahitian dancers were there, and then Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton were there as well, doing a little skit, <laughs> How to Handle a Woman, he sang, and she paraded around. And it, was, it was quite a unique show. We were the only rock group invited, and yet during the uh, during the rehearsals, we met Maharishi, who was there and was intending that there, there was an idea that he might speak somehow during on the show or during the show, which he, in fact, did not do. But he was in Paris at the time giving lectures. And with him uh, that night, as it, the, the, the curtain opened and we're this big orchestra behind us, we're, we're on stage. Right in the front row was Maharishi with John Lennon on one side and George Harrison on the other side. And uh, I'm, I'm going, whoa, this is a lot of, this is going to be a tough audience. <laughs> anyway, and the rest of the audience is all in tuxedos and black tie and gowns and jewelry and everything else. So it was quite a, it was the fanciest, most imposing audience that we had performed for, for a number of reasons. Anyway, later on, I mean, Later on, Maharishi did, in fact, uh, teach us TM about, about a few days later, just two or three days later. Uh, and uh, I remember that first experience of meditating as the most profoundly relaxed that I'd ever felt. And I felt that, gee, this is so simple and so relaxing that if everybody could, could learn this, then the world would be entirely different. And uh, I still feel that way. And um, the reason I felt that way, I came, came to find out, is that when you do learn to meditate, you learn a mental technique which is allows the mind to go to finer and finer levels of mental activity and transcending. That's where the word transcendental comes. Transcend in English means to go beyond. Transcending thought, going beyond meditation, going beyond thinking. You go to this deeper and finer level of, of the self, which is this area of infinite tranquility and peace and deep, deep relaxation physically as well as mentally. And what that does, it gives you a deeper quality of rest so that you can uh, be more dynamic in your thinking as well as your action. But anyway, the, the feeling of transcending and going to that deeper level of the self, it's deeper than deep sleep, which is twice as deep as deep sleep. Matter of fact, your metabolism or your breath rate, let's say, goes down to a level of, uh, of its deepest level when you're asleep. But with TM, your breath rate goes down to a level twice as deep as in deep sleep. So you're very profoundly re at rest. And that's why you feel so relaxed, because when you're asleep, you don't realize how relaxed you are. When, but when you're meditating, you're awake inside. It's just that you have your eyes closed and you're going within. It's a more inner direction. And uh, the results are profoundly relaxing and peaceful and tranquil. So uh, and it clears the whole body of fatigue and stress and anxiety and leaves you clear in order to appreciate uh, your life without the stress and fatigue and anxiety. 
So it's a very practical and very brilliant uh, tool of survival in a, in, a, in a stressful existence in a modern age. So I, I, I uh, immediately enjoyed that. I, I, it, was, it was the most enjoyable thing, and it was so simple to learn. I thought it, and anybody could anybody could learn it, and if ev and everybody did, it'd be a much different world. And, and uh, it's still true. Anyway, just a, two months later, I was in India. Um, I went to see Maharishi uh, speak in January in the Plaza Hotel in New York City, which is a very fancy hotel there. And um, he then went to Boston to speak at the Harvard Law Forum, a very, uh, that was a place in Harvard University uh, where it's a very intellectual audience. And that evening I called his hotel to find out where he would be next, and he invited me to come to India. And I told him, you know, okay, I'll be there. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, went to India, and then the Beatles, here come the Beatles. <laughs> Donovan was there, and so did Mi it was Mia Farrow. It was quite interesting. But the most interesting thing about it was being able to be there for a month and hear Maharishi give these lectures and explain the mechanics of the mind and the mechanics of nature and how uh, how to how TM helps one to evolve and use more of the conscious mind to become uh, uh, more creative and uh, more evolved and take fuller advantage of all that we have within us all this latent the worst things about the beach boys I think are the were is and are the business aspects of, of the career. You see, because every record company under the sun <laughs> cheats the, the, uh, the artists that are there. The artists are the reason they exist, these record companies. But they're also an expense to the company, which exists to make a profit. So therefore, they cheat you. They steal from you all the time. They account for the money, to try to hold on to your money for an extra year. They do all these accounting procedures and formulas, including directly stealing and bootlegging themselves. I mean, Capitol Records manufactured hundreds of thousands of Beach Boys and Beatle records in the 60s and sold them out the back door, did not account for them. Their own executives at the manufacturing plants were selling them. And uh, we know that. And we actually sued Capitol Records for an accounting um, because we were underpaid in, in 1968 or 9. And that's the reason we left that company. We went to Warner Brothers. But they're all the same because they're all structured to, to steal from the act. Well, let's put it this way. That's maybe a little too, maybe that's not very politic of me. But it's true. But the, the companies exist to make a profit. The artist is an expense. Therefore. They, in every case, try to cheat the artist in some way, some more blatantly, and, uh, but they're all set up that way. So I don't like that because I don't like ha being in business with someone and feeling they're inherently going to cheat you. You know they're going to steal from you. It's like that in the uh, film business as well. So the only thing you can do to counteract that you can't even change that, but the only thing you can do to answer that problem is to try to demand the largest amount of money as an advance that, that you possibly can. That's why you see in the newspaper these big sums of money. U2, U2 just made some big deal where they say it's worth $200 million. Well, they, it's, they probably got $25 million, but they make, <laughs> make it sound bigger. But, but the point is, the, the, the management of always tries to get as much money as you can in advance so that if the record company cheats you, at least you got some of the money <laughs> guaranteed in advance. So, so that, that I don't like, the, the, the business aspect, the business reality of, of, the, uh, of the business is just something that's not so much fun. I think that's the most negative part of it. Other than that, the human side of it is, uh, 
I think the, the existence of drugs and the, the impact that drugs has had on my cousin Brian, who was very fragile emotionally and psychologically, and the fact that he took things like uh, hallucinogenics such as LSD and smoked things such as hashish and marijuana, which cause him uh, causes in anyone who takes that paranoid responses because cannabis, cannabinol, it, it, it lodges in the reptilian core of the brain, which is a very primitive area of the brain which controls fight or flight response. It controls the, the it exhibits paranoia. Um, and so Brian being paranoid, schizophrenic, having taken these things, it, it affected him more than the, the ordinary person. Many people could do these things and function okay, but in Brian's case, it was too much for him. And so I really regret that. I think that's the most devastating thing in terms of the, uh, had Brian abstained from those things and been more healthy and more uh, productive, uh, the Beach Boys would be far more successful than, than they, they have been. Even though we've been very successful relative to other groups, lasted longer than many other groups, um, and had number one records from the mid 60s till as recently as uh, 88, 89, uh, still we would have been far more successful had there not been drugs. And of course, in the case of Dennis Wilson, my cousin, he died as a result of drug and alcoholism, although, although he technical reason was drowning. The reason he, I'm convinced that the reason he passed away was really because of um, cocaine and alcohol addiction. So that is the most unfortunate thing in terms of human terms that the, that the Beach Boys uh, some of the guys uh, got involved to to a great too great a degree to uh, with drugs. Yeah, the rest of us, Al Jardine and myself, and and Carl and Bruce never did. And, and as a result, we're still functioning and and uh, enjoy life and and have a good time singing because you know we started out singing not because we were getting paid enormous sums of money. We, we started out singing because we loved harmonizing, we loved singing, we liked music, and we began to make up songs, and it was fun. And so it's because of fun and the love of doing it that we started, and, and, and it's nice to be able to make a career out of doing something that you initially started because it was a hobby that you enjoyed and loved doing. And so we've been fortunate to be able to have a career uh, doing what we like doing. So there's a lot to be thankful for, but, but as I said, the, the business side and, and the, the drugs, excuse me, those, are, those were definitely the two of the most negative aspects of, of, of this musical experience. Uh, meditation and music, though, together, those, those are great. Those are the, the two better things for me, from my point of view.